and we're live! Hello, everybody! Uh, welcome in to another episode of Morning Ritual. Uh, this is our TTRPG talk show, um, where occasionally we talk about TTRPGs. Not often, sometimes. Sometimes we wind up talking for a couple hours about why there's no ramps in the X-Mansion. I do. We're actually, we've got a sponsor this morning. Um, we are sponsored by the wonderful folks over at Metal Weave Games. Uh, so they are going to be starting a Kickstarter for uh, their new Libations uh, book. And uh, I'm just going to switch us over to the promo for that. Oh, you're muted? Why is your audio not happening? <gasps> And now your audio should be working uh, just in time cool. for us to talk about libations, uh, which is uh, a collection of fantasy drinks that's presented uh, that's not as ingredients, but as guides uh, uh, for their, uh, it's not presented as creation, uh, sorry. You got this. I got this. <laughs> uh, Libations is a collection of fantasy drinks presented not in ingredients, guides for their creation, or uh, gameplay mechanics. Rather, they're a story of what happens when you obtain or drink them. Uh, each one in their own way is magical, uh, and whether uh, making you see people as having uh, heard the same bird song, seeing the night sky through a ceiling, or suddenly being handed a sword after hearing birds at the door. Um, uh, it's... Uh, they're not necessarily... Uh, alcoholic but they can help enhance the uh the flavor of your fantasy game uh so if you go to uh the backer kit link that is in chat right now uh you can sign up uh for notifications and updates as soon as it goes live on kickstarter which should be uh fairly shortly here the art in it is gorgeous and uh we love our friends over at metal weave but with that Shout out to HTT Family. Yeah. He's always always put together good stuff. Hell yeah. <laughs> he's, he's been like sending me little bits of art over the past few months, and it's so pretty. It's yeah. so pretty. Uh, Paladin, that's my Paladin's favorite. A good friend of the show. That's my favorite and least favorite thing about Paladin. He'll send me these pictures of art, and I'm like, I can't afford the commissions. <laughs> uh, it looks but, so good. Uh, but yeah, check it out. Uh, check it out, uh, and uh, go check out the backer kit for some updates. And uh, whenever it goes live, back this project. It's uh, it's it's a great uh, great project by wonderful people. And yeah, with that, this is morning ritual, our TTRPG talk show. Uh, and uh, we've got a special guest today. I'm Anita. Uh, pronouns she they. Uh, and uh, down here, I'm Noir. He they, and Matt. Hey, how's it going, buddy? Hi, I'm Matt Mercer. Uh, he, him, and uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks for, thanks for coming on, man. Uh, you have uh, clearly been our number one most requested guest. Uh, so thank you for saying yes. That was truly, truly awesome. I've, I've got to admit, I've had some questions that I want to ask you specifically for right. some time now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but bef before we do that, I, I'm going to confess some things before chat outs me because I know that they have been threatening to do so uh -oh. since about episode five of the show. Uh, <laughs> so I like to pick fights and one of the fights that I've picked uh, is with the entire continent of Australia. Uh, and one Liam O'Brien. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> okay. It's on site for Liam. I, I, it's, it, he makes me sad, and so that's where it is. There you go, Chat. You can't you can't threaten me with it anymore. <laughs> wait, wait. You're telling me that Liam O'Brien, in in this year of our Lord, has made you somehow sad? Oh no, this has been it, ongoing for the past two years. <laughs> It's on site for Liam. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's his birthday today. You it know is that, his right? birthday today. It's also Laura's birthday. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing, man? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's on to a great start. <laughs> perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> no, oh. he's, he's, our, he's our resident sad boy, and we love him for it. He is no one... No one can 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 stew in tragedy quite like him, and uh, and it is it is glorious, and he brings the pain for all of us. 
Uh, yeah. So if he makes you it's, sad, know that at least all of us are there with you in a wonderful way. Well, somebody's got to somebody's got to stop him. And I no one can stop him. He's unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> He's untethered, unbridled. The sadness is infinite, and we are but parts of the pool of tears. <laughs> and if I catch him in Australia, it's really going. To- <laughs> I respect that. It's a lot of people. Uh, there. <laughs> all right but uh, uh so just just to hop off of that uh onto a few questions matt one of the questions that i wanted to ask you just trying to act like i'm a professional here all of a sudden um <laughs> when i when i when i think about like what it must be like in the in the you know in the day-to-day of you uh one of the things that you know i've, I've always concerned about is we a lot of people a lot of us have the benefit of being able to talk to somebody and starting at zero like it felt very weird to kind of like ask you to be on this show because i don't know you yet i'm asking a favor of you um and i i I have to imagine that that happens to you quite a bit so i mean how do you deal with the fact that you don't you don't i mean this is just from the outside looking in you don't get the benefit of starting from zero like a lot of us do I think you always, uh, uh, to me, if I were you, I would always be wondering, like, what does this person want from me? Like, are they trying to, like, do they want a favor? Do they want to be on Critical Role? Like, how do you deal with that? That's got to be rough. Uh, I, wow. I mean, out of, out of the gate, this is a great question. And one, <laughs> interestingly enough, I don't think I've ever been asked. Uh, I will say one, therapy is helpful. Um, <laughs> no, it, this is interesting. Yeah, I... I don't know how all this happened, like, still, and it's it's a weird mix that nobody is built for. You know, any sort of platform or attention like this, uh, in some ways, is wonderful. In many ways, has its you know has its costs. Yeah. Um, and that's everything that I'm learning. And part of that is in a lot of spaces, especially spaces of of people that I, you know, respect or of mutual interests in. Um, it it is a. a there is a, a power imbalance no matter what happens, no matter no matter what right. circumstance. There, there is a, a, a change that I don't want and I didn't ask for, <laughs> but, it, but I can't avoid either. Um, I, it's hard and, it, and it's, it's challenging, especially when, as the years go on with, you know, elements of, of success, you begin to find pe- as a trusting person like me, some people are wonderful and some people are abusers and and yeah. users and uh it just takes a lot of effort to to learn from those experiences and not let that color your outlook on life and how you interact with the possibilities of meeting new good people um yeah i get yes. i hear questions all the time and it's overwhelming <laughs> uh i get it might and i can't tell you how many the, the most awkward conversation that i have far too often is with people who I've either known for years or just met in the industry who are voice actors and actors or writers and just people that I'm like, oh, I, I made a new friend, you know? And then within a short time, they're like, so how do I get on Critical Role? And it's like, oh. uh. that's That's the nightmare when I'm like, if I were to put myself in your shoes, it's just like, yeah. And so like, I, first off, thank you for answering that, honestly. And second off, like, all the best to you. I, I hope that doesn't happen too often. And I hope that when it does happen, you're, you're able to recover because that sucks, <laughs> dude. Like, that and, sucks. and I think it's, that it's easy uh, to become uh, like jaded or disillusioned when faced with those things. Um, but from everything that I see that you, it, you don't, ne- you don't necessarily let it uh, affect the good that you do in this space. Right. I, I don't want it to. Um, I will. <laughs> I will say I'm. I'm very thankful that uh, one. Uh, there are a lot of amazing people in this space that aren't like that. Um, that are just good. Good people. Good. I have a good support structure, and I'm so grateful that with the wild ride that Critical Role has been um, in in an industry that is predicated on the crushing of dreams and the, uh, the 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 destruction of of open hearts uh i've done this alongside with a found family that we trust each other implicitly like if it wasn't this crew if we weren't we weren't didn't love each other so much 
through this mm -hmm. awful screaming process of what the fuck is happening over the years. Um, I, I don't think any of us would have made it to this degree. And uh, so that's, that, that's my rock is, is yeah. having that when I need to circle the wagons, I got a family right there to, to support me and we support each other that way. So that, that's helped tremendously, but uh, it's not easy at times. <laughs> I, I, I'm as, as an, as a deeply introverted person, though, I know that doesn't come across who hates being on camera, which is why it's so funny that this happened as a voiceover was great. <laughs> I could just vanish into a booth and nobody gave a shit what I looked like, but on camera every week practically. Like you're all, you are constantly perceived and you do not wish to be. <laughs> every like every 10 minutes before we, we we start a session is like just me. Okay. Time to time to face the uh, the fear again. So but uh yeah, it's 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 a unique process. I'm thankful for so many things and it has instilled me with so much new dread. <laughs> um, I, 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 Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, continue. I'll, I was going to say, like, another weird aspect of it, especially with being an introverted person, is, like, you're the dungeon master of Critical Role. So, like, the eyes have to be on you, which is, an I think that's another aspect of it that, you know, the players don't necessarily have to deal with. That's, you know, you know, each player will have their time to shine. But the only consistent thing in Critical Role is that for anything to happen, you have to be involved. Like, there is mm -hmm. not a moment in Critical Role where Matt's not involved. Yeah, I'm not in the scene. I can sit back. No. That doesn't <laughs> so I, 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 I wonder if that is, if that has added to, like, if that has, like, how do you, how do you deal with that aspect of it? I mean, I, is that's not that's something that I really think the only people that can relate to it now are Abria and Brennan. Yeah. So I it, mean, I, it feels good <laughs> that you now have somebody to talk to about that. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, Abria and Brennan and a number of other people who who run games in this space, we have kind of a, a support structure amongst us where we we get together and we have lunch and we just kind of, you know, vent our frustrations with. The process and you know certain circumstances and we support each other and we text each other when we're having a rough time and uh you know, you know those who know tanya to pass you know uh we text a lot whenever we just need a little support so like we, I'm, there's there's a lot of good people out there who kind of know what it's like to be in certain positions of attention in this space and we kind of take care of each other when we need to um for uh for being in the game once again like it's before the game and after the game that the anxiety and tension hits once the game starts it still it just becomes me and my friends at the table and that's then it doesn't become that much of an issue you know they, okay. the cameras begin to fade that's been since day one with critical role like even when we first started streaming the deacon sunday and people that were involved were like you know we we'll really want to spice it up and do things that make it more of a show and we were, we were like absolutely not this is our home <laughs> game and it should never feel like it strays away that it doesn't feel like our home game anymore. And yeah, they have these sets and cameras and bills and whistles that we built over time, but the core of it, so much effort goes into just uh, maintaining that that zone, that space where it's still just me and my friends at the table, new and old. And I think that that has been key to me being able to push back against that pressure during the game. You know, we forget the cameras are there. We're, it's just us rolling dice and, and trying to make each other laugh and make each other cry and do, you know, cool things and tell good stories. And then at the end of the day, the cameras finish, uh, the show's done, and then I get in my car and go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you have, oh God, I'm sorry. I was going to say, what's your go-to uh, snack after the game? Because I know like whatever I, after I DM, I'm just like, I need fast food. I can't, I need like, I need like carbs and I need grease. And like, this is, this is like the comfort that I need to help re recharge my batteries. You are entirely correct. <laughs> and for me and Marisha, it is the Taco Bell ride on the way home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was just about to ask, what uh, do you have like a go-to way to kind of recharge? Is there like a you like binge a show, read a book? Like, you know, how how do you kind of put down the weight? I'm trying to figure that out still. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's 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 an interesting question, and uh, you know, not to get you know a little real here, but like the rate in which I'm able to cope with the responsibility and expectation and pressure is struggling to keep up with the rate that that expectation and responsibility and pressure is growing. 
So by the time I ad adjust my tools to be better prepared, it just keeps growing. So I'm, that's my struggle is to try and keep up with it and ensure that it's shepherded properly and that, you know, whenever anything grows to a certain degree, it could very easily fall into the realm of not being the heart that it once was or becoming some like cold corporate structure or, you know, fall into the hands of a little large company. And these are all the things that we swore would never happen. And so we've been like very careful to ensure that we are guiding the ship no matter how fast and screaming the rocket is, uh, but it just takes a lot of energy and effort to get there. So I'm um, for me, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to cope as we go. But when I when I can, often it's me and Marisha having board game nights. Um, I play, nice. I've, recently, I have like a, a monthly board game day that I've been playing a King Death campaign with with uh, with Abria, Brennan, Eric Ishi, and Spencer Stark, and we've been like. Uh, having just sort of having a recurring thing once a month that we could look forward to has been a wonderful recharge. Um, and just the sorry to cut you off, but Spencer is just the best bean. I love uh, I love me one whole Spencer. That whole the best. <laughs> uh, uh, all, all of them, and and so yeah, so, so pl playing games. Uh, our dog Omar is is a wonderful beacon of of so joy. Cute. He's the best. I don't know. I can't imagine what life was before we had that dog. Like, he's, Goodest boy. <laughs> I, I, I truly understand the 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 concept and necessity of a comfort animal. Like once we've had, <laughs> got that boy. Um, and outside of that, just actually, let's say just taking a walk here and there, getting outside. It, it can get so, especially after the pandemic began. Yeah, like, feeling indoors for so long can feel so oppressive and soul crushing. And so, just taking a minute to walk outside has been very helpful. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to hear about like you being able to be a person, uh, and especially being a person away from the camera. Because one of the common themes of these conversations that we've had with a lot of creators. Uh, and a lot of notable people in this space is the pseudo relationships that people can build, build, you know, with you not even being involved. And, you know, you know, the place that you take in people's lives that you don't even you're not even aware of, <laughs> like, you know, right. you know, and, and, and I think that that's that's one thing that I love to like talk directly uh with a lot of creators in this space about how you you know how, how do you digest that and also how do you set your boundaries that's that's a great question um uh, i am oh d digesting it is is a process uh still to this day um i ultimately and i've, I've had many long philosophical conversations about it ultimately this is a big part of my legacy and I want it to be one that's built and predicated on empowering other people and making people happy. Like that's all I want. I'm a, I, I'm a creative <laughs> and nothing makes me happier than making other people happy. Uh, and that's knowing that what we do can have that effect on many people is, is honestly the, the, the best thing about all this. And one of the things I do miss about doing conventions and events is being able to meet people and, you know, have them share their stories and and us to like engage and ask them about their characters and campaign and um, and just like you know, I, I love those points of connection. But there is a parasocial element too, where people bring a familiarity that I don't have, which can't be avoided when you're you know in a broadcasting space. Um, and when people are respectful, it's wonderful. Sometimes it can be very intense. Sometimes it can end up in like a trauma dump. Sometimes it can. It can put you in a sticky situation where you're like, I'm. I don't have the tools to to be what you're hoping I would be for you in this moment. <laughs> yeah. And right. and me as a human being right now, I'm having a panic attack in this moment. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 an odd thing to learn. And when it comes to community, as we're all very aware, um, there is a, a wonderful majority of of incredible supportive people that are very quiet and often a very, very loud toxic minority that can very well <laughs> kind of take the charge and feel like everything. And so social media brings its own discomfort and unhealthiness that I'm, you know, wrestling with here and there. And mm -hmm. pulling away from that has been very helpful. And as my therapist has said, continue to do that, Matt. Do, be, be, be less online on social media. Valid's Butterfly agreed again. Therapy is a very good thing. 
Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it truly, I mean, one of the most impressive things that you, one of the most impressive things about just your, your, your whole online presence is that you, it, you've got a lot that you're that's pulling and pushing at you yet you like yet you remain kind which i think has been undervalued it just just in being online you know like there is there's there there is that toxic side of twitter where they exist to be upset at things and you know for various reasons whether they're good or bad Yet you can you I mean I I don't think I've ever seen you snap <laughs> which is which is in, in admirable I mean because you're playing with your friends and you know when people critique critical role they're talking about your friends and I feel like they don't take that into account so I mean is is there a secret behind how you remain yourself present and still kind. That's interesting. Well, I, I think I think there's always room for critique, and you yeah, know, there there is a lot of critique that is that is valid too. Some of it that that we take to heart and learn from and, and change as we move forward. Some of it that we can't change because it's just critique that exists about how things exist. And you're like, yeah, it it sucks. I don't know what I can do. Uh, I'm me. Um, and then there's some that's bad faith, and you just kind of have to find a way to to delineate between those mm -hmm. and and continue moving forward with the important lessons um i think i think for me leading by example when you have a platform like this is so important and to your point there's there's it's easy for kindness to be forgotten yeah and i i want with whatever this platform of attention that i have that i didn't necessarily ask for, uh, <laughs> nor feel like I'm 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 right to be caring in times. Uh, <laughs> I I still want to do the best with it that I can, and if I can lead by example with kindness, then that that's what I want to do, and hopefully show people to to bring that to a, to the space where it's important. And mind you, like being angry, you know, and at the world right now is very viable for many <laughs> many many reasons, and so I entirely understand why people are angry. Because trust me. I'm real angry all the time. I just don't <laughs> shout it on social media. I, you know, because I'm not saying it doesn't mean I'm spending a lot of my days raging and quiet. Uh, <laughs> just mad in a quiet room, just seething. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cursing out usernames. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's so, but I choose not to to make that my presence online. I, mm -hmm. I lift the voices that are that are angry and speaking out rightfully from places that have more. Um, more of a place to speak from than I would on topics and then quietly digest my frustrations with the world and then try and, and put a little more kindness out there when I can. Heck yeah. Now I am, I'm going to curtail this conversation. I'm, I'm gonna, we're taking the left turn. Hey, All right, let's uh, do it. With one of the questions that I always ask, I need to prepare myself for it because I will be emotionally affected by this answer. <clears throat> Matt, there is a quiet war going on in the TTRPG community. Here we go. Between those of us that that think that dice exists to just be rolled and nothing further, and those of us that think that dice are the forbidden candy and they should be crunched on. Um, so my question to you. What side of this war are you on? Are you on stop the crunch? Don't put dice in your mouth. It's a choking hazard. You can damage your teeth. Or are you a cruncher? Somebody that, you know, chews on your dice. I, I'm a person that chews on my ice, which is not good for your teeth. And mm -hmm. I've been most of my life. Um, but I draw the line at dice. Yes! I'm not, I'm not a cruncher. Yes! Yes! Redemption. In your face! Redemption, In finally. Face. I, does, does this make up for the fact that Brennan was pro crunch? Brennan was a coward! <laughs> <laughs> now, like, to, be, to be fair, I understand it, and I have seen dice that I look at and go, I mean, that could be tasty, or that could feel good to chew, but this I don't This looks do like it. a lemon drop, right? right. I, un I understand the urge. I also understand that when you get close to the edge, that voice in your head goes, jump, jump, jump. Doesn't mean I do it. But I acknowledge Thank that you. it's there. <laughs> we acknowledge the feeling, we internalize it, and we move forward. Exactly. <laughs> so we have asked everybody 
feedback question. And Brittany, Brittany was like, crouch responsibly, which is not a thing. You can't do an irresponsible thing responsibly. And Abria uh, is the CEO of a dice company. So Abria goes, I personally don't uh, crouch dice, but I make dice look delicious on purpose to other people. I oh. was weaponizing the crog. I was about to say, that's that's some, that's some legal shaky ground there, Bria. Uh, that was, sounds uh, like a business endorsement. Uh, Bria was looking into scented, uh, scented ink for the dice to make them even oh, no. more tantalizing. Because, I mean, if you wind up eating them, then you have to Bria, buy more dice, doing? right? It's a perfect market. I mean, yeah, but that that is that that is the opposite of responsibly. That is, that is responsible. We all know that if we're able to choose chaos, given the chance, though. I know. Well, and, welcome and to Morning Ritual, where we expose the conspiracies in the TTRPG community. I'm here for this villain arc. I'm here for it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> The other question that I always ask people, and it's very, it's very weird to have you on because you're often the answer, one of the answers to this question, which is if you could play with any five people that are alive right now, Ooh. and you get to choose what game and who's the GM, who are you playing with? I can't tell you how many. Uh, uh, how many uh, uh, theoretical tables you've been at with Vin Diesel? You've played with Vin Diesel so many times on this on this question. And The Rock, I think. <laughs> As uh, weirdly, I can say having played with Vin Diesel. Uh, oh, that's right. There's a weird thing that I can say. What the hell? <laughs> um, very nice guy. Uh, he wouldn't be at my table. Uh, <laughs> there are better choices. Uh, I, honestly, uh, I would say I want, I'd probably Henry Cavill. Yeah, uh, I nice. want to. I want to play with that with that boy. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to see him reload his muscles over and over and over again. Yeah. Don't stop doing this, Henry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll maintain my thirst, please. If you continue, oh no, no, this is this is a thirst incurred zone. I'm right there with you. <laughs> This is a uh, thirst friendly zone. Don't forget to hydrate, folks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I would say my cider. Uh, I can still hear. I'll be right back. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> oh man, this, I'm like I'm like thinking too. Oh, is there people? Um, I would alive today. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's, that's the saying. that is always a sticking point for a lot of folks because it's like if it's dead or alive, then you've got a lot more options. But it also means it takes forever to answer the question. Exactly. Possibly. Um, I would, I would say Mike Patton, who's Mike the vocalist, Patton. vocalist for, um, Faith No More, Mr. Bungle, and is like my, one of my favorite musicians of all time and is just a, a wild figure. Um, I would also, oh man, I would, it feels, it feels, it feels snooty to say this. I want to play with Stephen Colbert again, cause he's really sweet and fun. <laughs> Um, that, it, that, I mean, it, it was amazing each time you I mean, like the two times that you guys have played. Like, uh, there's a part of me that's just like, could he be a special guest for Critical Role? Don't, don't think <laughs> we are constantly trying. It's never gonna happen. That man is so busy. But I know. Um, I would say also. Uh, man, I Lance Reddick. Oh, actor. Lance! Oh, yeah! I just want to. I just want him to talk to me. I know. That's the thing. I, want, <laughs> I, want, I want him to like to like sit in like some regal elf figure and just fucking take <gasps> take me away my imagination. Like, uh, uh. So that's <laughs> three. You said four people in a GM. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Any five people, and you get to choose the GM. Choose the perfect fit. So two more. I would say. Uh, Michio Kaku, who is an amazing mm -hmm. astrophysicist, uh, or like you know, quantum physicist, like, like just an incredibly uh, intelligent person with a, with a vibrant personality. That would be fun to bring that sort of like wild science brain to the creative energies of of <laughs> magic use in a fantasy world, and. Uh, 
kind of a cop out, but to GM it, I'd say Brandon Lee Mulligan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I have to tell you, one of the most interesting answers that we got for this, I can't remember who said it, but you would have been GMing uh, Dolly Parton and Elvira. <laughs> oh, well, there's my six or seven <laughs> right there. <laughs> I was just like, I want to see this. <laughs> I, and please let it be known to the world. Like if there is ever a charity endeavor in which I could gem for either of them, I I am there. I will cancel everything. I will if we can book. make this happy. Oh my goodness. I, because I want, look, look, I know I'm not going to get my dream, which is an Elvira and Dolly Parton buddy cop movie. So if I could just get them at a table. Oh my goodness. Oh, uh, and, uh, right? The other follow up is what game are you playing? Yeah, yeah, that's right. What game am I playing? Yeah, right now? Mm-hmm. edition. I meant for like this uh, imaginary table that we're building. Right, for the imaginary table, I would say. I mean, fifth, fifth edition for for the folks that are if they're like new and like learning a new system and then they want to be like I want to learn D and D, which you know a lot of people are that's their initiation. I'm like, sure, we could do that. That's that's familiar. Uh, but I might want to like, I don't know, make it. Now you have me like contemplating what what other. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what the that's what this question's for. Put some stress on you. <laughs> I don't. I, don't, I kind of want to do like Blades in the Dark or something. Ooh, Blades oh, is good. Blades is a good good game. I I love watching it. Still have never had a chance to play it, so I I wouldn't want to see this. <laughs> Heck yeah. Uh, so now, now that we took our little breather away, uh, I'll get back to some of the other clusters that I had for you, which is, yeah, yeah. Um, oh boy, like you are the face of Critical Role. So that means any decisions that Critical Role makes, essentially, I feel like you get the you get the brunt of either the criticism or the credit. Has, has there been any notable decisions where you're just like, I don't know, guys, because it's, you know, it's my face on, like, you know, it's my face on the shield that we got to, that we no, got to consider. That's a, that's entirely valid. Uh, and, and yeah, we have those conversations all the time. We don't ever do anything lightly. And everything that we right. do, uh, we all have, you know, have a consensus on that we, you know, it's we agreed upon from the very beginning. Yeah. Not all, not all things are easy, you know, having to, having to do and, and put out updates to our, you know, content, uh, like IP content for for fan art and community stuff is always tough because, and I understand we live in a place where you look at legalese and, you know, corporate <laughs> words ab- about, you know, ownership rights and stuff like that. Everyone immediately goes, oh, well, they're trying to, to abuse artists and take the art. And it's like, no, trust me, please look, look at, look at our history to help. We we're desperately trying to be as open as possible with everyone. We're not coming after the artists. We're coming after all the, all the, the Amazon bootleg companies We're coming after all the, the red bubble people that are, that are ripping off your art and ours. But in order to legally set our boundaries, you know, we have to put this verbiage out there to protect us. Yeah, um, it, it's gotten to the point you can't even put artists on, on Twitter without like a bot like coming and see you sniffing for art. Yeah, <laughs> turning it all into NFTs or some bullshit. So it's like, you know, they, whenever any of these things happen, as, as well-intentioned as they are, and and you can only ask for people's trust so much when you're like a company. Uh, right. And uh, to your point, I am, I don't want to be, but I'm the face <laughs> of it often and not. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so we have those conversations from like, Less about like, I don't know if I'm uncomfortable with this, though there are times when people like when the company will suggest something like, first off, no. <laughs> and and second, that's me. That's not going to happen. And we're like, cool, what's, what's, what's the next possibility we move forward? Um, but a lot of it's more just like conversations about bracing for impact. You know, we, kn- we know from what we're doing that we're, the knee jerk reactions are not how, what we're doing and how we're going to handle this, but we know it's coming and people are, and that's their right to have those worries and opinions and uh we'll just show them through action that that's not the case and that's the thing is so many people can say what they want online but it's action that makes sense and you know the actions speak louder than words in time and i mean ever since we've been doing things like that i hope people can see that you know that we're we're, 
We're true to our intent on this, but but every time it's my face and it's my Twitter feed that blows up, and it's just another per, an aspect of of the weird growth of our company to be like, eh, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna not go online for a couple weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, it's it's fair to say whenever Critical Role does do anything, that you are going to get some level of critique, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie, say that I haven't been on the hand of that. But one of the things that I'm starting to learn as I've you know been talking to more people in the industry and, and you have been lucky enough to have these conversations is that everything takes time. Um, everything takes time. And one of the, one of the main, one of the main major complaints then and now has been, you know, a lack of PLC at the table of critical role. Now I see, I see that, you know, that is changing. It, it, I would say that it is changing uh, as fast as a company can change things. Um, and I am glad to see, I am glad to see these changes, but there are others that are just like, it's not fast enough. It's not drastic enough and all this yeah. kind of stuff. And, uh, no, yeah. go ahead. I was saying, and, and, and that that's a perfect example of like valid critique that at the same time, there's only so much we could do. Right. In the sense that like everything that we built is around the the joy of of this group of this like kind of found family at the table and it's unfortunate that circumstantially the way it came together from finding peers in the voiceover industry that could make this game and like and there were other people who you know were people of color that were invited to the first games like tj storm who could make it because he was off doing you know mocap for godzilla and, yeah he'll be a colossus yeah so colossus. like so like it was it was a circumstantial gathering of of these people that then became an ongoing game which then became all of this and right um so are it, we just one second i'm just realizing that it's liam and laura's birthday today are we interviewing you on like the anniversary of when y'all met for the uh, first I mean, it, one of the first home games or was that after the fact it was after the fact it was for his birthday but it was later in the year okay. um but good catch on that uh <laughs> but yeah but but yeah i mean uh, it's because because we've had conversations about that and if there was a point of being like what the the whole point of of this and what we've predicated and built this on is this joy we have for each other at the table if we were to just get rid of a few people and replace them for the for the purpose of diversity does that feel honest also you okay. know it's uh, it I've, feels like I've, catch 22 like you're going to catch critique if you make the changes because then there's going to be a certain vocal uh set that is going to say that you're pandering mm -hmm. and oh. and and from and from my perspective too just adding people to the table having more than six players is already a nightmare you know seven <laughs> players is is my upper limit you know we had eight at <laughs> home and that was horrifying but it, I, I was willing to go the extra mile at the time and it like shaved years off my lifespan and so what we're continuously trying to do is try and find ways with guesting spots with now with campaign three long-term guesting spots um and other things that were that haven't happened yet and cool things that we can mix it up to try and bring more people into the fold to to, to begin transitioning further into a space where where it's not just us at the table but it yeah. like, to, to your point it takes time to do it right, to do it honestly, to do it in a way that feels deliberate, legitimate, and respectful. And it's the process has been happening for a long time, not as fast as some people will want, but we're, we're aware of it and we're constantly working towards it. And we got a lot of really cool, exciting things coming up that will continue to bring more and more people into the fold. So. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of compare, I, I, I kind of bring up the comparison of Critical Role and Saturday Night Live, which in the sense that Saturday Night Live can remove pieces easily. You know, you, there's you can have a new cast member whenever because the brand is essentially Saturday Night Live. Critical Role, the brand is essentially everybody that's at the table. So I think part of it is you have to train your audience as to how to accept the different, like how to accept different presence at the table. Um, and Again, I, what I wanted to like just personally 
as somebody that, you know, was very vocal about this very early on was to say that I do see that the changes are being made. I do see the effort and it is appreciated. Uh, and I just wanted to give you the chance to speak to people that weren't all oh, that, you know, that aren't like where I am, where it's just like, oh, okay, they're, they're doing the thing. So thank you oh, very much no. for that answer. That, that was, that's appreciated. No, thank uh, you. <laughs> and, and I'll, I, I, I'll, I, I, I give the credit to, to everyone who works with us and Marisha, who's developing the slate, like there's so much care and effort going into how we can continue to improve in these spaces and do it in a way that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't shock the audience. Cause to your point, it's a process. I mean, EXU and all these other shows that we're, we're developing, it's it's just that it's, it's, it's teaching our audience that's been used to us and built this thing on us for so long to also welcome new people and be like, comfortable change always is always scary to people especially if if they're relying on the familiarity as a as a comfort you know piece of media uh and so this is and is continuing to be a very positive way to to tell everyone like look yeah we're glad you appreciate what you do also appreciate what these people do i mean in even just episode one brennan uh running our calamity game a few days ago it was so fucking so good, good. <laughs> and and everyone at that table was incredible and and getting to show our audience uh how incredible of a gm he is getting to show everyone how incredible lou wilson is to show oh, is not just great as a gm but as a player she's incredible and then bringing in luis carrazo and show like these are all people that that you should now follow their work and yeah. go right. see what they do go go check out dimension 20 if you haven't already go check out you know luis's work on la by night like you know this we have this platform and to a degree it is a business meaning we have the livelihoods of employees that we want to be able to pay well for their time and take care of their families and give them good health insurance and all these responsibilities outside of just the the business there that people maybe don't don't consider yeah. you know we're not we're not doing this to maximize profit and live like kings we're doing <laughs> we're doing this to to make sure that this is a healthy business so we can maintain healthy lives for everyone who relies on us to maintain this business and i think it's easy Absolutely. for people who are on the outside to think that the work ends on thursday <laughs> work, work oh, Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I do have to shake my fist at you for taking two of Chicago's greatest talents, uh, Serena and Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I understand, but like I said, we're still drawing everyone to LA. <laughs> No, but it's like the Infinity Gauntlet of TTRPG talent. <laughs> Man, uh, just Abri go to the closet. I'll do it, do it myself. myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Abria's had that gauntlet for a year already. It's true. No one that from her. We are in we are in the Abria <laughs> epoch. And now shifting into the uh, into the, the Bronze, Bronze Age. Age. Which I love. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man, I have a question, uh, yes. and uh, I. Uh, just uh, put it out in, and saw if I could get a couple of uh, submitted questions from some folks on my TikTok. Uh, and one of them is, can you remember your first ever like D and D session, and what got you so hooked? Ed, that's a great question. Uh, the first the first session I ever had, uh, which I interestingly enough, there's a there's a podcast called Meditative Story that does this amazing hour long kind of. Uh, mindfulness meditation uh, sequences with like, you know, mindfulness prompts and stuff, but they interview people and kind of create a story about a, a formative part of their life. And uh, they asked me to do an episode and talking about kind of how RPGs have changed my life in different ways. And the first story is exactly that session. Um, and I hadn't thought about like the details of it in a while. And it was wild to kind of go back and revisit it, but it was, it was in high school, like, you know, freshman year, I'd known about D&D because &D my parents had bought me like some of the books at a garage sale. And I was like reading through the monster manual and just I've always had a love for mythology and cryptozoology and weird paranormal, you know, odd stuff growing up. Um, so that was very much my my bag. But I never had a chance to play until I was invited uh, by a bunch of seniors who were on the track team, who were also the helm of our popular arts club, which was our, our face forward title for the anime video game club uh and they invited me to come to their dnd game so i was doing art for the club and like design their logo and stuff like that and i was like so excited and so i built out this whole character this, this second edition dnd &D. i built a militant wizard named emeritus trent 
which is based directly on a Xanth character name wise, but I was very much wanting to, to kind of create my persona. And I worked on this whole backstory and wrote like a full like page and a half on it. And I'm super excited to dive in and I show up and it was very much like a, whatever rolling dice, killing shit, you know, fucking around type game. And I, I came for immersive story. They came to roll dice, kill monsters, get gold, <laughs> uh you know and and which is fine like like you know there's nothing wrong with a good dungeon crawl but i my expectations were very different which is another perfect example of why before you join a campaign or start a campaign expectations is an important thing to establish at the table for this reason alone um because neither none of our game styles were, were wrong they were just very incongruent mm -hmm. and after a few sessions of like being teased for trying to role play for being told to like calm down it's just a game you know, stop making silly voices, just roll your dice, whatever. We're going to we're gonna go through a portal and go to an in and out and we're going to level up and we eat a burger because it's the experience of a lifetime or whatever. I'm like, this is cheesy. I don't like, you know, the, there it was it just it wasn't it wasn't what I wanted it to be. And I think what hooked me was in my frustration, I began to see how how it could be if a different person was running it. And that's when I decided to to Dungeon Master for the first time was I wasn't getting the experience I wanted, so I would create it for my friends. And so I chose a few of my friends, uh, my friend Ian, my cousin, uh, Steve, now Steph, uh, and um, my friend Todd, and had them all make characters. And I just kind of winged it and immediately fell in love with the creation process and the collaborative process of, of building a story with friends. And so that's what hooked me. It wasn't the first session that hooked me as much as it was the possibility that eventually my first session as a DM showed me. And that's truly what hooked me. I, I relate to that in the sense that I, yeah, uh, my first D&D playing experience or one of my early ones, uh, I I wanted to role play as well. And uh, they punished my character for it. So yeah, I highly relate to that. <laughs> and also in and out is trash. I'm sorry, I have to do it to you, man. I know what you're I I like I grew up running it out and and I like it okay. Um and for the longest time I was like, oh, it's the best burger. And then I've had other burgers in other places since then. I've been like, eh, it's okay, burger. Uh, so I've I've got a question for you that I oh I, I this one's been brewing for a while and okay. it's about Marisha. Mm. Um the the Keyless treatment was just out of out of pocket, first off. But between Bo and Lodna, I think people are starting to under and and the legend of Vox Machina. I think people are starting to realize that Marisha inhabited the character so well that they couldn't differentiate. And now that we're on the other side of just the truly awfulness, like I, I have, I is there like a sense of like I, I don't know like what I'm trying to ask. Is there like vindication? a sense of vindication, validation? Like I told you. What, because like you know <laughs> kind of yeah yeah I, uh um it, and it was it was rough and yeah. you know many of us wanted to to be more aggressive online about it but she specifically asked not to because one she didn't want to make it a thing and two we you know it's hard being on the internet being a woman on the internet especially uh is, is a challenging space and, and she just didn't want to, to escalate things and asked very specifically not to but I think it was also, an, it was a newer time in actual play where people who weren't familiar with role-playing games had a harder time either delineating the difference between the character and the performer. Mm -hmm. um, and what has been very interesting is to see a lot of people who have come around to Keyleth over the years have been recognizing, this isn't always the case, but in a lot of them, they recognize that the reason they had a hard time with Keyleth is because some of her flaws reminded them of their own flaws. And they didn't like looking into that dark mirror. And so they ended up disliking a character because it reminded them of things that they wish they could change about themselves, you know? And that to me, I think is very, speaks powerfully to the performance of Keyleth and the character, the way she built it. And it speaks powerfully to the, the power of telling stories and self-reflection. It can be hard, yeah. but sometimes having a good hard look at the things you don't like about yourself and another character can be, if you allow it to be, a very healthy way to process and work through bettering things that maybe you want to try and work on um or seeing yourself in these stories and in these characters in a very healthy way and instead of of being bristled by it 
be part of that journey, be part of that ride and learn these same lessons like the character did. So it's, yeah. it's been, it's been very cool to see people come around to it. Um, in, in, in many ways and through Bo and, and Londa be like, Oh, Oh wow. Yeah. That was just a character. You're like, yeah. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> like every time I see one of these videos pop up, that's just like, we were wrong about Keyleth. I'm like, who's we? <laughs> like, <laughs> we speak in French now. Like, what's going on? Are we using the royal <laughs> wing? Is that what's happening here? Every time one of those videos passes my feed, I like bring it up on YouTube and we should be like, oh no, don't make me uncomfortable. I'm like, hey, you see? They're learning. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, to, to be a fly on the wall. I'm, because I, again, you guys have been much better than me than, like, at containing containing some of the heat because it's just like it's there are some things that are just it's obvious it's the character i'm sorry that that's a whole other thing anyway <laughs> whole other podcast what are you gonna do this this is the internet this is the internet where, where a video could show up on youtube of a person throwing a basketball into the sun and someone's like how'd they do that and like no it's a, it's cg i don't know what to do anymore like people won't believe anything on the internet uh, so I, I have you have you ever used used your platform or your status now uh, in a form of pettiness? I personally know that I have dealt with people at, on my come up in this space, and like you know, I have you know I I flaunted some, some success as a like a hey, remember you were talking all that good shit? Like now look at me, like. <laughs> 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 have you ever just been like some morons named an effect after me? Now, what are you going? You remember you talking? You remember you talking trash? Now what? Like. <laughs> I I I mean it's possible. I can't think of a specific moment, but partially because I I try and avoid any sort of possible conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure I'm sure I've like like said some like some some things to marisha i've been like yeah say like i've never done anything publicly but but in, but in private me and marisha have had conversations about me people that have treated us poorly in the past and stuff i've been like, hey. <laughs> like that's like that's maybe the extent of it you know I, I, no that's I, I, fair just just a hearty guffaw a at the situation them. yeah kind of i don't i'm not the kind of person to go for the throat unless someone really deserves it and uh <laughs> for the most part but i'm but i'm yeah i occasionally if 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 I can have a petty chuckle at 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 our success versus somebody who treated us poorly in the past, I'll I'll turn to Marisha and give her a little smile. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and so now here's here's a more like serious question to ask, uh, which is you you do have you have a tremendous success, and I know that you're also a person, and there are there are personal things that you want in life just like the rest of us because you are in fact human is it hard to like to like share like failures or troubles that you have um with people because they're just like well you've got all this like you know i just i i feel like a, a lot of the times people can ex ignore who you are as a person because they see who you are as a public figure. Is that yeah. something that you've, you've experienced? Yeah, no, tremendously. It's, it's, it's a different, it's a different circumstance of, of challenges and, and trials and tribulations on the other end. I'm very thankful that after years of being a, a destitute actor in Los Angeles and, you know, jumping from apart you know studio apartment to studio apartment and having to borrow money for my roommate to take care of me for months that that uh we can live a lot more comfortably now as i turn 40 next month um so like you know I, to to eventually gotten there i'm very grateful for that um but with with that success there is definitely a cost and with that comes a cost of privacy comes a cost of of some people looking at you like the the persona than the person to your point yeah and so some people will ask you know how are you doing and i'm like um i'm tired and stressed and they'll be like yeah but i mean everything's great i'm like 
<laughs> I'm, a, I'm a human being, bro. Like <laughs> you just said what you said. It like and that's yeah. and that's kind of what I what I you know I, the questions uh, predicated on and like you know it's a concern like because you you I, I do want you to be able to be a person. Everybody should be allowed to be a person, <laughs> you know. And so yeah. I'm, no. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, to be a person, and everyone deserves their own mess, their or their own measure of peace. Yeah. With no, and I, 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 I agree with that, and I appreciate that. I think, I think, once again, like like finding people that in this space can can relate to the odd dynamic of of attention. <laughs> you know, people like Abria and 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 Brennan, we you know, have having that kind of uh, that support structure has, has been very helpful in these circumstances because we can all. We can all relate to the challenges of this space, you know, front to back, um, in which other people would would find a hard point relating to, or would be wanting to push. I don't know a, a specific narrative to make themselves feel better when they've asked you to open up, and you're like, "That's not." I, look, if you just want me to support you here, I'm fine with that. But open up with that, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, it's it's unique, it's odd, and we're still figuring it out. There's 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 no real precedent to. Yeah, this because yeah, <laughs> especially with the way that you guys have gone about it, like you got a freaking cartoon, man. <laughs> That's awesome. It's <laughs> it's a I and once again, like like you know, with these serious questions and and being open about you know some of my struggles, I don't want anyone to ever think of it that I'm not grateful because oh, I am so filled with with appreciation for the support that has allowed us to create so many of these things, and we generally do create them, you know for everyone like for ourselves yeah. and for all of you this isn't like this, this isn't about trying to like plug back into an industry of farming content you know for for profit this is this is we are we are so excited that we get to make art the way we want to make it and and we're just thankful we have the opportunity um but there are challenges as part of the process and sacrifices that are made and and this path that we're walking we don't there's no precedent. So we're figuring out as we go, we're stepping into the dark and occasionally tripping and stubbing a toe. And, and I think what's great is, you know, I had this, I had lunch with Brennan a few weeks back and I was talking, I was like, it, we feel like we're stepping into the dark. And then when we hit something and like break our toe, we can look back at dimension 20 and be like, all right, don't step there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you guys are right moving here. in tandem in the best way though. I, and it's, it's, it's very weird to see two major, it, I'm so sorry to cut you off, but to see two major, players not be competitive but to kind of be like dimension 20 is clearly dimension 20 and critical role is clearly critical role i mean but you guys you, you you've 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 had the same players on you've now swapped gms it's just it's it's in the world of capitalist capitalism and competitiveness it's kind of nice to see what's happening between these two major brands I, I couldn't agree with you more. I One of the things I hate about the entertainment industry, especially, but like all forms of <laughs> American competitive driven capitalism is the idea that you succeed by tearing down your competition and by, you know, you succeed when others fail. That sort of, of mindset to me is so fucking toxic. And whereas there is opportunity in, in, in space here to instead lift each other up and as opposed to being the most successful, let's all just be kind of successful together. Like, you know, right. let's, let, let's find find the space where we can all coexist and and share our notes and share our experiences, share our our lessons and things we've learned and and traps that we've stumbled into, and and instead make it a better space for all of us to create. And I think that is we we want to show that that is not just viable, but it ultimately can be a much better way to to run an industry. And so uh, I'm I'm very thankful that that we have a lot of good people in this space that uh, this, have the same thoughts, that have the same philosophy on this, and uh, we wish we want to keep pushing that. Heck yeah, I, I, we we call it uh, leaving the door open behind you uh, yes. on, on this, which is the which is like success doesn't have to come at the cost of somebody else. You know, yes. one person winning does not mean everybody else loses. So I cannot tell you what it means to hear like critical, like again, you know, critical role being like what it is having that philosophy. And I, and I kind of already knew that that's where you all were with just the people that you have 
on the crew and in front of the camera, uh, again, Serena, Spencer, these are be- just people that are just so big hearted. So just, it's very refreshing. There's, I think on the, uh, we're still very much on the come up in this space ourselves. And, you know, there's a lot more ankle biting closer to the ground than there is at the top. And that's, that's, comforting <laughs> well, but we, we hope to we hope that people see this and realize that you don't gotta bite ankles so much um, a lot of times it is definitely that crab in a bucket mentality where if someone tries to yeah, rise yeah, up it's just, there's someone there to cut them down yeah i mean it's easy and it's, and it's easy for me to say that because we are you know we have been doing this for a long time and we are at a point of success so i also acknowledge that you know perspective is different from here than people that are just starting in this space too but we've also been doing this for you know seven years now Mm -hmm. and we're also part of a right people right time right circumstance kind of lightning strike scenario Um, so we also acknowledge that Um, but regardless of of the the challenges that are there and and how how slow it may seem i cannot emphasize enough the importance to, to not fall victim to the mentality of tearing other people down to succeed it is it will it will not just not lead to success but everyone will remember that and those yes. running that do succeed will not work with you. We, will, <laughs> we all know each other and we'll continue to know each other in this industry and everybody talks. Like, you know, if, if you want to talk at a turn, you want, to, you want to split some lies, you want to be an asshole about it, like that shit gets around fast. Just be a exactly. good person and lift each other up. Then people will work with you and they'll recommend you and we'll, we'll you know, p- promote your stuff. Like that's what this should be. <laughs> absolutely absolutely um let's see we are coming up on an hour here do we want to take a quick break or you guys feel like how we feel it everybody uh sure we can take a quick break um i can how um, you feeling matt we've got got a little bit of uh audio for this uh libations promo uh so Mm -hmm. we will be back in about 10 minutes folks see you soon rest at my threshold and find comfort in the hearth Drink deeply of a storied depth. Seek you comfort, be it with the warm body lull of a bottle that feels like summer afternoons, or the feel. And we're back. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the second half, which we uh, lovingly refer to as the dark roast, uh, where we ask a little bit more serious topics. Uh, Yeah. Uh, This has been so fun so far, everybody. Thank all for showing up. We're not really fit to ask more serious questions because we 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 popped we popped our load in the beginning. So uh, (laughs) but I do want to say call me Kramer Kramer Kramer. Kramer, uh, thank you very much for complimenting the overlay. They were done by the lovely Anita here. So. I do all the overlays on the channel and all the graphic design for us. So, yeah. Hell yeah. Because I'm a graphic designer by trade. <laughs> all right. So, now it's question time. Uh, yeah. And my first question is to you, Mr. Mercer. You have had, like hundreds of episodes of world building. I can't remember anything from my last session. And I know people are sending you like, well, in episode like 47 of the first season, you said this and this about, you know, a marketplace. How do you deal with that shit? Uh, (laughs) Patiently. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's I, it's been a unique uh, transition from being uh, a person who was just building a game for my friends at the table to now building a game for many people to be consuming and meticulously combing through all of my lore and world building and, you know, del- delighted to point out any sort of contradictions or mistakes or incongruencies. And I, I mean, that... That's what fandom does. I know this growing up in fandom. It's you know, it's 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 how you show your passion for something is to also point out where where you fucked up. Um, but uh, I, it doesn't bother me. Uh, but I do hope people understand that a lot of the game is improvised. You know, I, as much as I'm building my world, 
that, you know, I don't build sessions from point A to point B to point C and we follow a through line. There's no like, you know, outlines or anything we're shared and rehearsing in advance. Like we don't know what's going to happen game to game. And so a lot of it tends to be improvised. And sometimes I don't remember details from two years ago. I don't remember details from four weeks ago and might accidentally contradict myself, in which case I try and eventually smooth out the lore or correct myself in, you know, a tweet or something. Um, it's going to happen. And I don't, I don't, you know, detract anybody for for realizing it or asking about it, and it's just it's just the nature of the game we play. So I deal with it with patience. Oh, I just it's got to be a little bit of a mindfuck to know that there's somebody out there that knows as much or a little bit more of what exists of your world than you. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Danny Carr, she's our lore keeper for a reason. She, you know, <laughs> we we, had, we built a position for her at the company because one, I needed help. Uh, and and two, she's incredible, and and this has been as suffused in this world as anybody for for a long time. And it's been tremendous to have somebody that I could be like, hey, Danny, what did I say about this thing once? <laughs> it's it's really helpful. <laughs> that's that's got to be very that's got to be very convenient and awesome. Like I I, I don't I, I've recently had the experience of one of my players telling me something about my world that I straight up forgot. I went to my notes and I'm like, oh, my God, that is a thing. And it's just like. It, it, I mean, it, it means that it's real now and yours is in books and wikis and Oh, <laughs> it's, it's very weird. It's very wild. Um, and I think what the initially was a lot of pressure <laughs> uh, on me to like, you know, don't fuck this up, Matt, work really hard, spend a lot of time to try and like, dot, you know, dot your T's and cross your eyes uh, to, to, to make sure that for the most part, things felt like there was an internal logic to everything. That's a big part for me. Yeah. It's like, and when it comes to fantasy worlds, which can lose their logic very quickly, I'm a very I'm a very big fan of like being fantastical, but having a consistent thread of internal logic so that everything still feels like it fits together and plays off each other and reacts to each other in the world building circumstance. And from there, the role play can thrive and and, and play and dance around. Um, so just taking that more seriously as the years go on, as I know more people are paying attention to, has been a, a bit of a stressful thing, but also been a very cool process to kind of cut my teeth on taking my world building more seriously. And then from there, collaborating with people to expand it from there. I love collaboration. I love people bringing in new ideas. And like, it began with the first Haldore guide working with uh, uh, Joey, you know, James Hake, uh, and then with Haldore Reborn working with him and, and Hannah Rose, uh, all incredible people, incredible collaborators with Wild Mount Guide, working with with uh, Joey again, as well as James Tricasso and Chris Lockie to expand parts of Wild Mount. And now with Marquette bringing on even more incredible writers like Bashir Gauss, uh, uh, Justice Armin, uh, Jasmine uh, Bilar, which we spoke about earlier, uh, and Mackenzie Armas, like being able to, to have other people come into this space and show me how good they are at world building too, and taking small threads and running with them and coming back and showing me how much cooler it is than anything I could have done. I absolutely <laughs> adore that process. Because one, it takes a little bit of pressure off me. And two, it shows me that there are other people out there that are doing as good, if not better work than me. And we all get to build this together. And like, once again, the call back to you know, a lot of the world building that I did with, with Brennan on uh, EXU Calamity. Um, I can't take much of the credit for that. You know, I was there to help facilitate things. And we had a lot of jam sessions, you know, on Zoom for hours, like talking about stuff and, and creating stuff. But a lot of Avalier and a lot of the stuff is shit that he was excited to build. And we just kind of let him off the leash to go. And uh, I love nothing more than watching people excitedly creating in this space that I started and making me proud. <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that actually kind of follows up into the question uh, that uh, someone else posed to me. I believe that was uh, my friend Halfling Nikki asked, uh, how do you actually prep other GMs to take the big chair uh, in mm. your world? Uh, like when an, uh, when Abria stepped in for uh, EXU and or when Brennan did a bang up job the other night, uh, yeah. How do you do that? Like, and also, how does it feel like letting go of what is essentially like your your baby? Uh, let well, I'll, I'll start with answering the, the, the latter half. Uh, letting go of it is both scary and thrilling. Um, it is a it is an exciting trust exercise, um, but. 
anybody that would be stepping into that chair with this world has already proved themselves to be a trustworthy person by that point. And so at that point, it's mostly just excitement. And I'm, I'm just kind of cheering him from the sidelines, being like, go, go. Uh, or in you know, Iggy's case, cheering him from across the table. Uh, <laughs> for, for the process on that, uh, for preparing people for the table, I mean, a lot of that credit also goes to Marisha and the production team. We do a lot of test games, like with, when Abrie came on board, it was a lot of running a lot of session zeros and doing kind of chemistry uh, one shots with the different possible performers that we want to bring into the fold for future, not just the EXU, but future sessions. So we wanted to kind of get everyone at the table, people we like, but we wanted to watch them play in this space and kind of just see who worked well with who. And uh, Table and chemistry is too. very important. It's very important, uh, not just for actual pace, plays, but for just gaming, like finding good people you jive with at the table. And uh, with, the, with the Bria for that too, it was a lot of uh, showing her the space, both making her feel comfortable and supported at this table and any questions that she had, anything she wanted to, to work on to ask us and then we could facilitate that. Me and her had a, like some DM workshops where, uh, you know, less like me, teaching her how she knows very well how to do it, but more just mm -hmm. being a, a resource for her if she had any questions and, and building maps with terrain, you know, she didn't have a lot of experience doing that. And so it was teaching her how to do some of that and bringing in some people to support with that. Um, and just, you know, giving notes to to the, the pace of how we run things, you know, keeping track of, of you know, time best you can, uh, story beats, and just also answering any questions about lore from the story that she wanted to build, which since I was a player, I couldn't engage with very often. So that's where Danny came in and was her support for EXU to be able to wow. answer a lot of those lore questions since I was a player, I didn't want to know anything. I, you don't want that spoil, you don't want spoilers. Exactly. So uh, that, was, <laughs> that was kind of the process there. And and for Brennan, same thing. It was a lot of meetings, uh, go, going over lore, going over uh, the themes of the time period. You know, Age of Arcanum is essentially, it's the fall of Rome. It's, it's, it, late stage capitalism is the villain of the age of Arcanum. It is, it is, it is the fall of a society that has risen, you know, so high. Parts of it, at least, the floating cities definitely are kind of like the America, you know, we're the top of our game. Fuck all you terrestrial cities and people that have to work with the gods and stuff. You know, it's it's very much that vibe, which is very much Brennan's vibe. So it wasn't a whole <laughs> lot I had to push in that realm uh, and. And it, it helps that both of Bria and Brennan are very familiar with Exandria. You know, they're, they're, they both have watched the show for many years and know the world, know the themes. And and it wasn't a lot of prep beyond just, just getting together and spitballing and, and seeing what comes out, so. So, okay, on, on that end, on the actual play side of things, I mean, it, it looks like a very Grease will, like you, there's some understanding of now how to do the show, how to bring in a new GM, and how to kind of create a spinoff. Um, I, we've gotten our first season of Legend of Vox Machina, uh, and Lord knows I mean, you got you have another, I think, two seasons that we can look forward to. Yeah, we're almost um, done in production on season two, and it's going to be so fucking good. <laughs> Listen, the first season... I I was never a Percy stand, but I kind of I think I'm a Percy stand. <laughs> the no mercy best. Percy was done so well. Oh, uh, that and that's that's tribute to the the art team, the wonderful board artists and animators, and like they they took so much of the things that we saw in our mind's eye when we were playing this game and just elevated them to such a level that we were like, this is the coolest thing. Like, thank you and between, hell yeah, yeah. Between like no mercy Percy and Scanbo. And it's mm -hmm. like, this is like, this just, it was plucked out of my brain and placed on a screen and it's lovely. Love it. mm. Anyway, sorry, your question. Yeah, oh, but on, on that regards, I was, I was going to say, now that you've done your first season of Legend of Vox Machina, are, are you, is there a similar Grease Will effect that's happening with the animation side of this where you, you're like, okay, we had our, we had our learning curve on the first season. Now we're kind of getting into the groove of it in the second season. Very much so. Very much so. You know, with any production, anybody who's worked on that scale, animation or otherwise, you know, the initial pre-production stages take so much time because it's establishing the pipelines. It's getting all the teams established. It's figuring out the initial, you know, establishing designs of the world and the characters. It's locking in the, the themes and the music. It's 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 there's so much leading up to the actual beginning of production. 
uh, that's a large bulk of just the initial year and a half of, you know, the production cycle. But once that's all established and you get through the kinks and bumps of figuring out how this giant chimera of a machine of, of talent is going to work together, then it, it begins to run a lot smoother. And season two is, has been a, a, a very smooth process so far. And uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be good. <laughs> uh, and with that, here's, uh, here's my next question, which is kind of alluding back to one of your answers before, which is you're kind of just walking in the dark with the brand as a whole and stumbling on things and teaching uh, teaching the ones behind you like, hey, don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but with stumbling in the dark, that kind of means that anything is possible. <laughs> like uh, in, in, in uh, I, I guess... I, I, I guess what the the question that I'm trying to ask is like, I can only imagine. Like, it, it was very clear on everybody's face during the Kickstarter for the cartoon that it was a surprise by how much people are invested in the brand and are willing to jump in. I can't see that going unnoticed by other forms of media. Like I can't, I can't see like a gaming company going. Well, oh, I mean, we might want to get in on this, or like a movie studio going. Well, we might want to get in on this. So it's just like, where do you cap? Like you know, where where do you go? Okay, let's not try this. Like, how do you choose those opportunities? That's a very good question, and I will say a lot of those opportunities have come to us, and a lot of them we've said no to. You know. Uh, because we've worked so hard for so long to even get to this point, we're very meticulous with making sure that if we do anything, we do it right. Right. Um, to learn from our, our past mistakes and, and, and to try and make sure that we, we really, we only have one shot to do any of these things correctly. And we want to make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're all gung ho about it. And so, uh, you know, going with, with the prime team for the series, they were the only people in the market that were, that were that didn't want to own us, <laughs> which is weird when you think of Amazon. Uh, you know, but like, but like most everyone else were like, yeah, we want to work with you, but we want to own you guys. And they were the ones like, we want to facilitate you and be partners and let you be the creative heads on this and just see where it goes, head thing. And we we're like, that's exactly what we want. And okay, let's try it out. Um, for uh, and, and then other opportunities have come forward, whether it be like video game stuff or things, and we're like, it's just not a right fit. And right now maybe it's not the right time and so we're we're definitely looking for chances to do things that do feel right um and you know hopefully more conversations come forward as we go but but we're we're, we're not looking to cash in we, we want to we put our whole lives into this this is this is like i said before this is our legacy and we want to do it right and to that same point we hope in doing it right we open the door for other people i want to see some dimension 20 animated stuff i want to see Heck yeah yes. know, I, I, I want to see other actual plays now, because of the success of Legend of Vox Machina, have the opportunity to break into other media and continue to build their brands. You know, like I, I we share resources all the time. There was there was a, a the rap article I think that went up a couple weeks ago that showed like the quarter one, you know, viewer demand for adult to animation out there, and Legend of Vox Machina was number one by a margin, and which we didn't have any numbers at that point because nobody shares numbers on that <laughs> side. And we were like, okay, so people seem to like it. That's cool. And we immediately started sharing it with other friends in the space being like, if you're having any conversations, use this to your advantage. Let this be ammunition to show people that this is viable for people to create cool shit. Because once again, you share resources and help each other, you know, out and, and lift each other up in this space. And I, I hope that through the success of the Kickstarter and the success of, of Flesh and Box Machina, it shows people in the industry that are coming out of the woodwork that not only is this viable, but this is a wonderful place to, to take stories and tell them in other mediums and in doing so bring success to other incredible creators. <laughs> that, 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 that's awesome. Uh, I, 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 I have a question in mind because uh, I, I was reminded of a conversation uh, that I had a couple of days leading up to this because I uh, discovered you were involved, you were involved in a pro uh, project that I did not know you were involved in, and I was a fan of it before I knew that you were involved. Uh, School of Thrones. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when are we gonna get you behind the director's chair again, my guy? Oh man. Uh... 
well, well you know i have my copious amounts of free time these days uh, uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd 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 love to jump in for if it's the right project and the right thing i, I wouldn't mind directing something again um i did i got a little burnout out on web media after the end of that project um oh, okay it was definitely it was definitely in the era of the internet where everyone who was funding projects you know the full screens the machinimas all these big companies it was like three to five minutes long form content nobody watches anything longer than five minutes on the internet <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, like that, that was very much the mindset. And so it was, it was challenging to get funding for things. And a lot of these projects like school of thrones, you know, I put a lot of my own money into it, uh, at a time where I didn't have a lot of money. And at the end of the day, because of bad contracts and stuff, I ended up making negative dollars. In fact, I don't think I've made any, I've made probably between that and other web series that I've directed over the years, I've made a grand total of like negative $12,000. Uh, oh over God. like a seven year period. And, uh, School of Thoughts has one major fan. Like just, I just, I, I had no idea that was you. Like I should have figured because, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but to that point, I'm still super proud of it. And what, what, what we didn't make in financial gain, we made in the relationships, the people that we had a chance to work with and create with. You know, I did a web series before that called There Will Be Brawl, which was like a, a Nintendo kind of Smash Brothers film noir HBO crime drama series that was very low budget. Uh, it, it's super cheesy and I don't even know if it holds up as well these days, but but I met some of my favorite people through that production who are still to this day some of my best friends and like chosen family. And I, I, I'm so thankful for the creative projects and the process there. So it's never been about you know, making the money more than just making something that's worthwhile and the people that you meet through it. And School of Thrones is one of those examples where like, I still communicate with a lot of those people. Ashley Birch, who I, we just become friends before that and she plays uh, Daenerys in that and she's incredible in it. We shot the whole thing on UCLA campus uh, with the help of their 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 film club and, and we had very little money and it was just fly by the seat of our pants and see what we could put together. And we, we were really proud of the series we did at the time. It was, for those that aren't aware, it's a, it's like a Game of Thrones universe circa season three or so, because that was what was out at the time. Yeah. Um, but in like a John Hughes high school film. <laughs> super cheesy, super silly. And I directed it and I played a hound. Uh, <laughs> uh, 12K is worth found family, uh, according to Nikki and Chad. See, I agree. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I, I don't screw all y'all. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's easy to say that in hindsight. At the time, at the time, at the time, that was it was it was not it's not a good thing at all. Yes, I had to do I had to do a lot of odd jobs uh, to make up for a, that. There's also a lot that's of a lot of chat door right dashing for, to make up for that. Uh, mm -hmm. I was gonna say there's a lot of oh. love in chat right now for uh, there will be brawl as well. Oh yay! That was a fun time. <laughs> Oh, uh, so I, 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 another question here, and this is, this is, I'm sure you get this one uh, more often than some of the other questions here, which is, uh, who is the hardest to GM for? Oh, like, like a person or a type of person? Just a part, like just uh, amongst the people that you normally GM for, it could be guests or anything, just because I know, I, I know I have, I have players that always do things that I never would have considered ever. And it's just, it's it's the most fun kind of nightmare. Cause it's no. just like, well, I guess I'm improv -ing. No, I, okay, I, I see your point exactly. And I would say it's probably a combination. It also depends on the character they're playing too. Um, but more often than not, Sam Regal is an agent of absolute fucking chaos. <laughs> um, but I love that. And Travis is a big, big button pusher. Uh, then once again, depending on the character, because like campaign two, Travis's Ford was a little more reserved and like intentionally, he was very much like more of a, 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 a commander, you know, thinking type character. Campaign three, Chetney is, is un unleashed. Small, <laughs> angry man. Yeah. And he, he just goes places there. Like the, the, the <laughs> there's a couple episodes ago before he went on, on the EXU Calamity break, where the, the opening sequence, he just went on a full, like, like stealth mission to go like get vengeance on a shopkeeper that charged him a little too much. And it was a whole like 20 second interlude. I was like, what are you doing? You know, like, so yeah, I, it, but I love those moments. Cause once again, like that, that's the magic. If, if everyone followed what you thought they do and it just worked out 
as expected, then at well, that point, just script it. Like, you know, what's what's the point of playing these games? It's the moments of improv. It's the things, it's the moments that you're having to just make stuff up on the fly as a GM and as a player that like the real magic, the real meat of, of tabletop comes out. And so, yeah, the, those two definitely are, are, are two, two instigators. But I will say Laura in campaign two is Jester in particular. Watched her, <laughs> watched her really embrace chaos mode in a way that I wasn't expecting and I adored. Oh. <laughs> The absolute legend move of that cupcake with the dust of deliciousness. Uh, oh, 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 oh. That was so that? good, it should have been on ESPN. <laughs> that would be like that a... That should have been a play of the game, play right? play of the game, TTRPG oh. edition. I I had spent I had spent so much time building out this meticulous swamp battle map with like... I had a, a custom 3D print of, of like her hut with like a mini and all this... And, like, and, and I was so excited for this like possible multi-stage like boss battle in which there was like like a a, a hidden like we're, i don't, don't want to spoil too much after campaign but like this this character actually was part of a coven but had like locked away the two other members of the coven and was basically using them as like power batteries and it was going to draw them into the, like a, a next second stage of the battle there and, like all this cool stuff and then that happened and i'm like and all that just goes away <laughs> cue, cue the, the other uh scene of you just tearing up a character sheet yeah but, but i love that too like <laughs> yeah, but... you, you can't be precious with the stuff you built and you yeah. just follow where the story goes and it's it's so much fun and That's... i was i was gonna be a petty bitch on your behalf you're like if, if, if you know if everybody went uh the way you expected it might as well be uh scripted i was gonna be like but matt i watched the youtube video is it critical role scripted <laughs> Every time, every time somebody says that, I like gain a year on my lifespan. It's it's, un, it's unintentionally like the sweetest compliment. Every time people are like trying to stick it to us, and we're like, "Thank you." That's, that's that speaks very highly of of the game. That's actually very sweet. I love it. I'm, I'm very proud of this narrative that we've been crafting through improvisation, and the fact that you think that it's scripted is the highest compliment. Thank you. And and and, and to that point, like anybody who's played any long form campaign with people they trust and you know, on that level, you know that it you've had those moments at your table too, where you're like the dice tell the perfect moments at the perfect time. Someone comes up with a crazy idea, and narratively, it's cinematic, and things work out in a way. Often they don't, but you don't remember the moments they don't. You only remember the ones that they do. And and that becomes an incredible moment. And it's like people that, that end up saying something like that, I'm like, maybe you need to find the right table to, to realize that all of everybody can have these experiences and these moments. <laughs> so speaking of goobers on YouTube, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about the Matt Mercer effect because uh, uh, I know it, <laughs> it, like on one hand, I'm like, you know, I would love to be dope enough where somebody's like the noir effect, but also fuck that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that would be a pain to my like on uh, I I want to know what is your honest thoughts on it? Like okay. it, honest thoughts, it is the tiniest albatross. It is like super small. But uh it it's very small albatross. I to an extent for the for the real experiences that this has brought to people the mercer effect i i, I feel bad that was none of that is my intent you know we're not right. we're not trying to set unrealistic expectations we're trying to just show people i mean honestly the, the main reason we started streaming was because i after years of desperately failing to explain to people at like social events what dungeons and dragons was i was like i, I wanted a video to point them to yeah. <laughs> so like it's just easier to show it you know uh and and so, like, the, the, the fact that what we've done could have created any sort of, like, bad experiences for people, I feel bad about it. But at the same time, like, anybody that's creating these circumstances, you got to look inward, man. I, I can't take responsibility <laughs> yeah. for you being a shitty person or a shitty player with, with, with unrealistic expectations from a new game group. And it's, you know... Uh, if anything, I'm frustrated that it gets it gets wielded like a, like a, a cudgel yeah. so often. Yeah. So... One of the things that I want to do is let's co-opt it. If you could choose what it is, like we we're taking it back. If you could choose <laughs> what the first effect is, what is it? Like, I'm very curious. Like, my, if we, 
my opinion of what the Mercer effect should be is the ever climbing rise in long vests being sold. I think, yes! I think bringing, bringing the long vest <laughs> into fashion, that to me is the true Mercer effect, which I'm <laughs> only not wearing now because I woke up to do this at 8 a.m. <laughs> which we thank you for. No worries. <laughs> Pacific time is a bear. Uh, <laughs> that is the only effect that we recognize now. It's just long vests. Bringing long vests into fashion All right. and keeping them. So, <laughs> so let's start to wind down, uh, and we're going to wind down uh, with uh, with the That Guy segment of our show, which is if you've been in the TTRPG space for long enough, you've probably had the displeasure of playing with the That Guy. This is someone that is a veritable black hole of fun uh, at the table. Somebody, if they were yeeted into the sun, your experience would increase tenfold. So, Matt... Do you have a bad guy story? I do. I I will omit the names <laughs> to protect the innocent and not so innocent. <laughs> and possibly some of the circumstances around it. So I apologize in advance for the vagueness of this, but the best way I can describe it. There was a circumstance where I was running a game with people and one of the players is a, was a very serious player i mean in a sense that like i have what i call it protagonist syndrome where there are there are people in games and in life who kind of walk through life like they're the hero of the story and we're all just their npcs to facilitate their narrative um that's just the kind of player they were and the kind of person they were uh and there was somebody else at the table who was a jovial comedic player who continuously couldn't roll shit and was failing at everything they did, but having a fun time doing it. The first player min-maxed doing so much damage and just like is there to tear through a, a dungeon and just rock it. And has been, I mean, because of the, the build they were using, very much steamrolling through a lot of stuff and probably did half of the entire party's damage the entire adventure. And all of us were acknowledging it and cheering it on. And like, hell yeah, that's great. And they're they're living their best life. Um, while this jovial, funny, comedic player just was doing nothing, added nothing to it, but was but was bringing comedy and silliness and and having a good time. We get to the end of, of this 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 fight, uh, the boss battle, the final encounter, and the the first player, the, the protagonist, um, is doing most of the damage and stuff, and it it gets toward, kind of towards the climax where they're feeling like it's hurt. And, and they're probably going to, to maybe turn this around and be victorious. They throw all of their stuff into like one final round of attacks and they just roll a one. Like they roll like really poorly and miss all their attacks. And you can see on their face that they're like, this is my, my 14th heroic moment where I kill the final <laughs> boss. And they missed all their attacks that round. And on their Oof. face, you could see like, like their frustration. And the other comedic player rightfully says like man pull your own weight <laughs> <laughs> who has never who has never like and it's funny because it's it's self-deprecating and acknowledging the fact that he's done nothing this entire game right this other player has done everything and is exemplifying it well this first player does not have a <laughs> sense of humor about it uh we finish the game and immediately the first player starts threatening to beat the shit out of the second player wow like like getting in their face talking high school locker room pushing them and like threatening to, to just beat the shit out of them while the second player is like, <sighs> what's going on why where is this coming from what it was it was so wild other players were like what is happening holding their heads and and uh it we had to like diffuse it and yeah it, 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 it broke my heart and then i haven't played with these people in a, in a long time since and i managed to to meet the second player again after many you know a couple of years of not seeing each other and the second player was like i'm so glad you reached out i thought you guys didn't like me i thought i messed up and ruined the game and i was like no you were amazing the first <laughs> player is an awful person and i'll never play with them again please don't feel that way and so to me it was just a perfect example of like the really really bad type of player that i never want to play with ruining somebody else's not just experience but making them feel for years like they had ruined Ooh. friendships yeah and yeah. yeah it's really 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 unfortunate 
I mean, they, like I get, we always say, they, there has to be a certain level of empathy required to sit at the table. Like, you have to understand this is a team thing. Like, no one person is ever going to be the lead, the lead character. <laughs> like, uh, uh, I this actually begs a question uh, that I think. Uh, it'd be very good for us to, to to ask, which is, what do you think are requirements of a player? Of, 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 of a what do you what do you think is, is the recipe for a good player? For me, it's empathy, being able to like understand how everybody at the table is feeling, um, being able to take accountability. You know, if I'm wrong, say you know I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I, and try to fix it like you know what in your experience at the table like what have you seen that you go that makes a good player that's that's a great question i mean very much the things that you said uh em empathy and and being aware of everyone else's kind of a, emotional place at the table and being open to discussing that before a game you know if someone's having a rough week and you can kind of tell like feeling okay like i'm having a rough week like all right and acknowledging that will all adjust accordingly if you, you know, right. how your energy is at the table. Other important factors are listening, you know, like, like listening and, and being eager to, to facilitate other people's moments in the game, you know, yeah. sharing the spotlight. It's very much a theater and improv, you know, uh, skill set. And, and, and at the table, it's, it's so wonderful to, to invest in other people's moments and find the ability to tee them up. That's something that like Sam, Regal does so well for as much as he is a ball of chaos. He also is so good at finding the right moment to then spotlight another player and kind of lift them up into a moment. And like, I adore uh, players who are able to acknowledge those moments and be like, I could take the spotlight, but it'd be cooler if I help this player do it and give them a heroic moment. Um, That's an excellent point. It's not only sharing the spotlight, it's pushing the people into the spotlight when you know that they need it. Yeah, and when they're comfortable to it. And it's also yeah. acknowledging when people don't want the spotlight, <laughs> but those who are like, you see that spark in their eye and you see them like kind of leaning forward at the table because there's an idea brewing and being like, how do I facilitate this moment for them right now? You know, and and, <laughs> and healing that space, I think it's so wonderful at the table. I'm uh, sorry, I'm listening, man. It's just so Metazola54321 and chat goes, you got to stop, collaborate, and listen. And I'm like, I hate you for, <laughs> for doing that to me right now. But I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, thank you for gifting that price. <laughs> perfect. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. Uh, Everything wow. comes back to the vanilla ice principle. Can we call it that vanilla, vanilla ice principle? principle? Vanilla ice principle. That's what it is. A tabletop gaming born right here. You are all present for it. Let us all hope to to lift this principle. The, the whole time he was trying to make us better D and D players. And Winkle, wherever you are, you don't care. But <laughs> I, I I will say another another great player thing uh, beyond just just listening at the table too is um, being able to embrace failure as much as yes. You. Like knowing that that failing a role or failing at a circumstance is an opportunity for a deeper, more interesting story and furthering excitement. Because that just means more stakes can be brought to the table, especially in game systems where failure allows the GM to make a GM move and you know raise the stakes and introduce more challenges. It is designed as an engine to, to embrace failure as a way to further the story, you know. And games like D D, it's not part of the engine, but a lot of GMs have been playing it for a long time kind of do it instinctually. So I love that a lot of newer, you know, indie games are kind of building it into its play. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 being able to embrace failure for the exciting thing that it can be, and for how it can it can elevate the next stages of the story, uh, is is a wonderful thing for a player to to, to have an instinct for or to to learn through time. Uh, in fact, honestly, I think sometimes failure can lead to as memorable, if not more memorable, moments than success can. I was just about to say, I think I think the best stories come from failures. Honestly, it's it's always more compelling to watch a hero stand back up than to just watch them like kick the shit out of the bad guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So yeah, yeah no, I I absolutely feel that. So it it's it also sounds like um, 
in, in terms of if we're just you know making a recipe for a good player empathy self-awareness um being able to roll with the story and self-awareness um you know being able to understand this is how i'm this is what i'm feeling this is how i'm this is how i'm expressing that this is how it's being received and maybe rein it in <laughs> yeah so yeah <laughs> The vanilla ice principle, everybody. <laughs> God damn it, man. <laughs> if that if that's the legacy of this show, I'm happy with it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm gonna get that uh, framed on my wall. Like <laughs> gold leaf scrolling. It's gonna be great. Calligraphy. Well, make sure that it's a nice calligraphy. Stop. <laughs> Collaborate. I just and I want you to that, know. That'll be the new live, laugh, love. Oh no! no it keeps getting worse. In the front I, of GM screens, you know. Stop, collaborate, and listen. I'm letting you know right now. If Vanilla Ice ever ends up on Critical Role, I'm taking credit for it. me and Metazoa are taking credit for it. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I don't know if that's gonna happen anytime soon. But if it does, I'll let you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I want to be that one guy that I want to be the one guy in your life that it was just like most people like when they maybe they asked me to be on Critical Role. This weirdo asked me to have ice with the ice on Critical Role. <laughs> oh, I love uh, that is always willing to take credit for two percent of the profits. You know what? Nice. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> like, are we Shark Tank now? We'll take the deal. <laughs> we'll take that deal. Uh, uh, this, is a series. So those yes, are... this is a series professional interview. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for reporting that out. So, <laughs> and show, speaking of professional, my head just died. One second. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to fist fight Logitech. Uh, <laughs> boop, 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 boop. There yeah. we go. And we're back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess my question, and this is a question that I have been asking uh, guests as they come in, which is um, if if you could have, oh, well, actually, we have two questions that we always ask that I completely forgot to ask. Um, then... Matt, you are God King of TTRPGs for one day. Anything you will comes to fruition if you, if you want uh, to snap your fingers and uh, create a new company, it could be as big as Watsi or bigger. What do you do in this one day? Oh, and is it is it industry specific or is it, or is um, it community specific? It's it's industry and community. Any, like if you want, like you know, suddenly everyone watching this show has like. 10,000 viewers for their own private streams or what it, it could be as utterly ridiculous as possible. I mean, it's, we've it's, had people want to start uh, production companies uh, so that uh, more yeah. actual play spaces can have uh, better val better production values. That's Sam funny. DeLev's answer, I believe, was uh, accessibility is required in all studios and access, uh, accessibility options are required in all uh, uh, in everything published from all publishers. So it's just stuff like that. So anything you want. Oh, man. Uh, I. This is a little a little, I guess, stranger and obtuse in some ways, I guess I, I would I would expand the interest in tabletop gaming to support to be large enough to support all creators that are creating in the space Heck yeah. i i i want both because i think tabletop games are such a wonderful way to rediscover community in person to to, to find your your you know your your friends and family and to further connect family uh both blood and not uh and also, there's just so many great creators out there. And it is expanding. I mean, I remember, you know, growing up through the 90s to the 2000s, watching all my great game stores close and vanish, you know, in the early 2010s, like, RPGs were were dying on the vine. And, you know, as, you know love or hate D&D 5th edition, you know, and the rise of actual play really kind of innovated and, and expanded this industry to allow a lot of people to create. But it, it still is 
not where it can be to support so many of these great ideas and creators that are doing work out there, uh, at least not to the scale that they deserve. And so that would be my wish is for is for suddenly the whole world to be like, hey, let's play an RPG and let's go to each toe and like buy a bunch of cool indie shit. Like that would be what I want. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot what the last question was. <laughs> Help it. me, Anita. <laughs> Got crunch. Five players. Crunch. Yeah. Help me. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Nikki, There's you're in help. chat. Tell me if there's another question you forgot. <laughs> We're so good at this. We actually had uh, a guest on the show write down the questions and prep for them ahead of time. But that's also because she's a teacher and uh, she knows what she's doing. Knows yeah. what she's doing. She prepped for the lesson. She's like, I lost my list. I lost it. And well, instead of our usual question, uh, oh right, the IP question. Awesome. Mm. Thank you, Dylan. Um, so my if time. you could have one IP. If you could create a brand new IP and it would be as big as any existing IP, but the one that exists is replaced. So if you create a new IP and you want it to be as big as Star Wars, Star Wars goes away. Which IP are you replacing? So is this combination of both? So this is what IP is big that I'd want to see go away? Uh, basically <laughs> like if you could if you could have critical role as big as any like it doesn't even need to be Ooh. critical role. if you could create something brand new mm -hmm. like and it could be as big as i don't know freaking star wars star trek harry potter whatever but that one that it, it's as big as goes away what are you what uh what are you picking uh I mean, to 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 be big and replaceable, I'd say Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> uh, one one suggestion from chat is long vest replace Gucci. I mean, that's why I love. I and I no no shade to anyone who likes to spend a lot of money on good threads, but I like I don't I don't I don't get dropping nine hundred dollars for a t shirt, y'all. That that'll, that'll forever be outside of my realm of. When I found out. Supreme had a brick that sold for like a couple. It was a brick that said Supreme and somebody bought it. I almost threw my phone, but I didn't because I'm too poor to do dumb stuff like that and buy a brick that has Supreme. On it. Man, it took it took many friends to convince me to to spend fifty dollars on a pair of nice boots once. Like it, it, uh, it's, just not, it's not my realm of expertise, but uh, but but to be fair, nice boots make a difference. They last a lot. Uh, I, I I will I mean I don't want to I don't want to be too big that's scary <laughs> <laughs> like it was critical role as it is right now is way too much wow. I would you say know what? it's so weird that like when people usually say things like that it's like of like it's like theoretically that would be scary but it's like a, a, a lived experience for you when you say like yeah, being is, too big is so scary like yeah, that's and, I know, yeah it, it is it, it, like I couldn't <laughs> imagine that would be just absolutely terrifying on a daily basis and like yeah. good on you for uh, i uh, well it's i would i would i'm gonna i'm gonna lean in the video game market a little bit i guess because that's, mm -hmm. that's that's very familiar with me i would i would probably i would probably there's many layers to this which is funny i get rid of call of duty uh i think we're i think we're done personally with <laughs> with first person war shooters, Jesus Christ. And I say this as a person who's worked on Call of Duty as a game, you know, QA tester manager for years back in the day. Um, I guess that only reinforces my opinion on that. And I would replace it with uh, a new high quality kind of point and click style adventure yes. RPG, like like in the realm of, of like a, a merger of the old LucasArts, you know, Secret of Monkey Island Maniac Mansion stuff would bring in some oh. of, uh, uh, oh, what was, I can't remember, uh, Disco Elysium vibes to it. Ah, oh, Disco Elysium, know. so good. Mm -hmm. Like asking questions where there aren't any right answers, there's just your answers, but I think you found the right answer. <laughs> like I, uh, I am here for the return of point and click adventure games. Yeah, there's the good resurgence. ones out there. There are some uh, really good ones out there. But I want uh, I wasn't even braced. <laughs> uh, and this is this is gonna be my last question, so we can let you go here. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thanks uh, for having me. They, oh, anytime. 
Uh, you know what I mean? Just let us know whenever you want to come through. But um, if you could give advice, just any advice to new players, experienced players, people trying to come up in the TTRPG community, just what do you think is the one piece of advice that you think is solid for any aspect of people in this community? The most fun is found when everybody's having fun. There and it is. So that's it. Amazing. And I don't think yeah. there's any better place for us to end today's episode uh, than on that note. Uh, thank you all so much for stopping by and hanging out with us today. Uh, we're going to go on a raid uh, to our good friend. Uh, who do we want to go say hi to? Why don't we go say hi to Sam to live? They're playing... Uh... Horizon Forbidden Dawn. So, oh, yeah. Sam is, Sam is. Uh, we, we we've lovingly nicknamed them Thanos. Uh, their their <laughs> goal is to turn half the universe gay. So, <laughs> so that's where we're gonna go hang out. So yeah, let's uh, thank uh, let's you all so hand. much for joining us. Yeah, thank you all so yeah. much for joining us. And Matt, thanks so much for uh, agreeing and uh, coming and hanging out with us for uh, for a little over two hours. But uh, until next time, everybody. The ritual has concluded. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, y'all. <laughs>